Hello, I'm Jeff Judge, and welcome to the More Than Spanish podcast, where it is my job to interview people from abroad who have come to live in the Cadiz region. We will learn from their stories, tricks, and tips to adjusting to the culture, language, and life here in Southern Spain. In this episode, we have a couple originally from Iowa, USA, who have lived in Rota for almost five years. So let's jump right into the interview. Well, welcome to the podcast. So can you two go ahead and introduce yourselves? I'm Mike. And I'm Jess. And we've lived in Rota for almost five years. We are both from Iowa. That's where we met. And we spent a total of eight years living overseas. Okay. So before you came to Spain, what were your expectations? What did you hear about Rota before you came? Um, what were your expectations? What did you expect? Not a lot, really. Um, <laughs> we heard that the houses were small, but we weren't really giving any pictures or description, just that the houses were small. I disagree, because where we would lived before, it was a two-bedroom, second-floor apartment, and I was super excited to have, like, a house and things and create this whole thing, and I heard it was paradise, it were next to the beach, and it was just going to be amazing, and everyone wants to live here. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> okay, you guys can agree Fair to enough. disagree. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, so now think back when you first arrived. I don't know where you came in, if you came into the Jerez airport or elsewhere, Sevilla, whatever. When you first arrived, that first day or first few days, do you remember what was one of the first things that shocked you or surprised you about the culture here in southern Spain? Hmm. I remember we, um, so we were staying in a hotel initially, and we went out for a walk. It was after our daughter had taken a nap, and it was like, 2.30 ish and we walked out and it was ghost town there was no one outside and we're like this is not there surely people live here there are houses and cars <laughs> but I just I knew of the concept of siesta but I didn't realize that like it could be middle of the night I mean actually there are more people out in the middle of the night than there are at 3 o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> so yeah the whole concept of siesta and how everything really does just come to a grinding halt and what, what month of the year was that? Uh, April. Yes. Okay. April. And you, Mike, what, what kind of surprised you about the culture when you first came? Um, so I remember one of the first places we ate at, we, we decided to order a paella. Oh, yeah. And I had no idea. I knew what paella was, but I didn't... We knew it was Spanish. We knew it was Spanish, but I didn't know it took... <laughs> an hour and a half to cook a paella. <laughs> we had our baby so, with us. She so we starving. were just sitting in this restaurant like, what is, what's going on? And, you know, that's just one thing that you don't, unless you know how to make a paella, um, you don't really understand. And so, yeah, we just, we kind of sat in this restaurant for the longest time and then they brought out this huge paella for two people and we ended up taking like a lot of it home. so much home and like I don't think we ever ate it. it well, no, it we ate it at the restaurant. It was really, really good at the restaurant, so we were very eager yeah. to take it home. But we're from Iowa. We don't really, there's no seafood. There was like catfish, and yeah. I not really any seafood. So we didn't think about this, this, this smell in our fridge, in our whole hotel room <laughs> smelled like fish after. And um, we didn't realize that they keep the heads on the shrimp. And so when it came out, we were like, what? there's like eyes in our food. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was really, really good. Um, and we had heard from a friend that you, you know, that that would happen. It just, it's, it's still surprising. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, and Iowa, I, I imagine if you order shrimp, they cut the heads off. They're, yeah, yeah usually like come frozen, peeled. Right? No, yeah, not frozen at the store. Yeah. they are frozen at the store. I'm gonna yeah. stop. <laughs> so when you guys first arrived, what was your level of Spanish like? Mine was almost non-existent. I took one year in high school and barely passed. I took four years in high school. Um, when we came, we were 24. Anyway, so it wasn't that long. It was more recent for me. But I did always speak in the present tense. 
um, because mm. conjugating verbs was too hard for me. And so I would talk to our neighbor and be like, today I go to the store and tomorrow I go to the basics or, you know, whatever. Yeah. I would always say to present. Yeah. And I have to like write things out before I go to the store. When we went to Ikea in Boston Furniture and we had to return one of our shelves and like it was this whole ordeal. Um, I would have like so a beginner list. to a meet like interview. Beginner, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. that's that's all I need to say. And, and you <laughs> bubble pops. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> so your wife had a better level than you. Yes, she always has. Okay. So how would you describe your level now after this these years here in Rota? Mm. Have you improved? I yes. I would say yes. Yes, I we've would, improved. It's still very difficult for me to speak in Spanish, but as far as what I understand is uh, so much better than what it was when we first got here. Okay. Um, I think a lot of that is just being around our Spanish neighbors and listening to them talk or trying to you know, get something, get a point across or um, ask for help with something, you pick up new words and um, after a while you're like, oh yeah, I know what that word is. Yeah. <laughs> I get like 15 to 20 percent of what they're talking about yeah. most of the time, whereas she can hold a whole conversation. Well, it, depending on the topic. So, um, <laughs> if, so I try to talk myself in Spanish. And when we, especially when we first moved here, I would like try to talk. Well, my daughter was four months old when we came, and so you're supposed to talk to them anyway to, for them to develop their language. So I talked to her in like very intermediate, very beginner Spanish is what I mean. And so then I'd talk to myself in intermediate to try and build those communication skills. Of course, there's not very dynamic. It's not very dynamic to talk to yourself. And so I, depending on the topic, I can hold a whole conversation. But otherwise, I just kind of get a glazed look and I'm like, oh, I don't know okay. what you're telling me. So um, I think it's difficult too with the the Andalusian accent yes. and how fast they speak too. Well, and we have our handyman swallows all of his words yeah. and he is like impossible to understand and so I'll walk away thinking like I'm pretty sure he said this but I might be wrong so we need to adjust for that little bit of margin of error <laughs> um, that happens a lot with him and a lot of times I'll understand like the topic but I won't understand like specific words the details right okay so what language learning advice or what language advice would you give somebody who's going to be moving here to this area? What would you tell them to do? Start listening to Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. Listening Definitely start so important. listening. Um, you know, they have Rosetta Stone and stuff like that. Um, I feel we like had that available to us, but we didn't really... I used it more than you did. Yeah, I didn't use it. But like, when I did Rosetta Stone, it was like, Bird, airplane. I'm just like, words. Just words. And like yeah. you would put words together, but it wasn't applicable to going to Ikea and trying to return a bookshelf. So I felt like way out of my level when I went there. And when I, I think one of the first conversations that I had was with a stranger on the street. I was looking for the trash and I could not find the trash. And so um, I think I asked him, like, trahe? Because that sounded like maybe that would be the Spanish word for trash. It's not, by the way, so don't try that. Yeah, that <laughs> means <not>. suit. <laughs> <laughs> he was just really confused. <laughs> but to start listening and to, um, to look up words that you use now, because life here isn't all that much different than it is in the States. It's You still have to take the trash out. You still buy groceries. You still, I mean, if you buy a lot of avocado in the States, well, that's an easy one, it's avocado. Mm -hmm. But like if you buy a lot of whatever, yeah. Memorize those words. Oh, memorize the, the food, the, the words of the food in Spanish that yes. you usually, yeah. That, that, you would, would, that you would want to look for in a store. Yeah, that makes sense. If you're a mom, learn the word for diapers, pañales. You're going to need that. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to need that. And so just look up the topical words now before you leave. Okay. In podcasts in Spanish. Even if it's Latin Spanish, it still helps. Are there any podcasts or apps or software that you would recommend? Any specific ones that have been helpful for you? So um, when I, we first came, Duolingo yeah, was Duolingo. just starting out. And so that was really helpful for me. Um, and there's just a ton of podcasts. I can't remember which ones I listened to. I don't know. Okay. 
but you know, there's a ton out there. Just do your research and find one that you like. Okay. So. Now, what about any kind of culture advice would you give anyone coming here? Like before you were explaining how you didn't know that paellas are, are made from, they should be made from scratch <laughs> <laughs> when you order them. And many times on the menu, it does say, you know, expect at least a 30 minute wait if but you order by. It'll say that in Spanish. It'll say that in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't know Spanish, you don't realize that 30 minutes minimum is normal for paella. Yeah. Is there any other culture advice, uh, tips and tricks of the culture, of the local culture that you would like to prevent other people from suffering? I think you have to come with an open mind. Um, I think a, a lot of people that come here, um, mostly Americans, um, the American culture is very rushed and that's not how it is here. It's very, they're, it's not that they're lazy, it's that they're, they're in no hurry. Their it's, priorities are different. When you go to a restaurant with your family or your friends in, in Spain, when you're Spanish, it's, it's a very intimate, just gathering like you would in your house. Whereas when Americans go out to eat, they want their order taken, they want their drinks, they, they want everything very prompt, and then they're out the door. Yeah. Um, so you can go out to eat in America and be done in 30 minutes, whereas it's very typical to spend two or more hours at a restaurant in Spain, yeah. and they don't bat an eye at it. Right. Um, yeah, you don't have the waiter giving you the evil eye to get out of the restaurant. Not even right. close. Yeah. In fact, if like we've gone to a restaurant because we were Americans, we eat a little bit earlier, and we'll go and all the tables are reserved. <laughs> and have you seen that? So all the tables are reserved, but the res reservation's not until like seven or eight, and we're showing up there at six. But they're saying, "Oh, this table's reserved for the entire night. It's not a thirty-minute, forty-minute reservation. Yeah, it's, it's this. They're they're gonna be here the whole night. And so <laughs> we're, this is their table for the whole night. And yeah, I should say that one more time to emphasize." <laughs> They're not trying to turn the table to get not in. Not even close. Right. Not even close. And even, um, well, for coffees and stuff. If you go to a coffee shop, oh, so this is another cultural thing. Their coffee shops are also all bars. There will be a big bar, and there will be liquor in the back, but they also have a coffee machine. Yeah. <laughs> so in, during the day, it's a coffee shop. People can go and get coffee con leche with churros or a little sandwich. And then in the evening, it's still a very much family-oriented place. Like you, when you think of a bar in the States, yeah. you would not take your family, typically. Kids. kids. You would take your kids. Maybe yeah. for lunch. Maybe. But not in the evening. But they do here. And it's not any kind of thing. You see kids all over the place at all hours. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, since you have kids, so we'll talk about the family-friendly atmosphere in Spain. Um, the, what... <laughs> Speaking of kids. Yeah, speaking of kids, we might have some background noise, so that's totally understandable. Um, have you, did you notice a difference where kids being included or they just come along differently? Like you said, in the States, there are some bars that will say no one under 21 admitted. Sure. What about here? I think it, Spain is very, very kid friendly. Um, even if they don't have a, a playground at the restaurant or which a lot the, of them do which a lot of them do but even if they don't the the spanish people it's it's very typical to just have the kids kind of running around playing together with other kids it's not or, looked down on in it's the, not looked down on it's States, not a nuisance like running around the restaurant you'd be looked down on i mean there's been this whole big thing about kids in restaurants and what, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate if it's a family family restaurant then you know anyway so that that does not exist in Spain right. and when we first got here I thought the kids were very rude and um, not disciplined because they would just go crazy of course my child was young then I didn't understand how hard it is to have a toddler in a restaurant <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> it's not any kind of big thing and there it's very welcoming and it, a lot of the restaurants do have playgrounds which I wish that the states had yeah it'd be so yeah, we have an eight-year-old, and we strategically will go to restaurants with those playgrounds because, I, I mean, it's as much in it for our son as, yes. as for us. And then the parents can relax because yeah. your, your children are out there playing, mm -hmm. and you can just 
take your time knowing that they're being entertained too and it's not on a tablet or yeah. a cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times there is a TV in like the little kid room, but there's also a lot of other stuff for them to do. Hmm. So, yeah. Good. Handy, handy. Um, what about any must-see or must-do places or things in the area? I mean, we live in Cadiz, in the area of Cadiz. Where were there any places or beaches or towns that you say if you come here you have to go? So, because we've had small kids and we kind of have kept our American schedule, we haven't traveled a whole lot. But I will say that getting to know your neighbors is so important. I know a lot of Americans who you know they had to have a parking spot as part of their lease, and so they they have a, they, they drive the car in go to the house, drive the car out, and go wherever they're going. We don't have that. We have street parking. And so if, whenever we leave our house, everyone on the whole street sees the circus <laughs> coming down the street. You know, <laughs> One of them's running ahead. One of them's got to tie her shoes. And like it's this whole big shebang. But so our neighbors know us. And they know when they haven't seen us in a while. I mean, they know when we need help. We've had people help us carrying groceries. And just a favor for a favor. And we have had better experiences Spanish authentic home cooking experiences with our neighbors than we than you could ever have on a vacation. Yeah. I mean, if you you could go to Cordoba or, or Cadiz or Sevilla or you know Vejer, any of those places and have a really cool experience walking around towns, but to build relationships with Spanish people because they are so kind and open and loving and generous. What what do you think, as a foreigner here, how did they receive you? Was there any, like for example, when I first lived abroad, and I mean this was right before 9-11, and then 9-11 happened, and there was a lot of, my parents were kind of freaked out. My parents live in Ohio, and they were, oh, everybody hates Americans overseas, yeah. and and I'm like, what are you talking about? That's yeah. not my experience. On the contrary, I felt like the times I've said, hey, I'm from the United States, doors have opened, um, people have been curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? How have you been received here, knowing that you're from the United States? What have the, what's the treatment been? I don't think that, at least in my experience, I don't think that there's ever been a negative Never. Connotation to being an American. Or they might from make the fun of us, States. especially during the election. Like, oh yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that, but yeah, that, that I, was a big thing. Like, what's going on with your with your country? Because how often do Americans talk about the French election or the German election? But the rest, I mean, you can't yeah. go somewhere without hearing about Trump or Hillary or this or that or the Kardashians or I mean, it's all very Americanized being pumped out I don't I don't know about any of that but they are very interested in our, our culture hmm. but I, I feel like often American as a whole are so self-focused that we don't anyway that's kind of a side thing but they're very interested in our culture and in our well-versed in our own news yeah. so to converse with them is very easy typically hmm. I mean from my experience hmm. so you've really never felt rejected or pushed aside because you're from the United States. No, not even close. That's great. Yeah. Well, let me ask you some uh, nitty -gritty, gritty things about, well, restaurant advice. Um, any advice about restaurants, eating out? Uh, we talked a little bit about it before with kids, there's playgrounds, but yeah. anything else you can think of that makes the restaurant experience pleasant, like times of the day. Right, that's what I was thinking the most. Because, well, because I'm an American, I read more American English, and so all of the parenting blogs and things that I read are on American schedules, and so that's kind of what I've gone for. Um, but Spanish schedules are very, very different. So they don't often even open the restaurant for lunch until one. And they might have breakfast there, but it's like toast and some cured ham. And that's it. And so... But not all places. Not all places. They have like tortilla de patata and, and other things too. But usually, I think because of where we are, there's a, there's a large American population. So they kind of... There's some restaurants who cater to that. There's some restaurants that don't. So I think 
as a general rule for lunch, they don't open for lunch until 1. They'll let you sit down, but the kitchen's not even open until 12 or 1. And then for dinner, it's like they don't even open until 7, unless it's an Americanized restaurant, like the Thai restaurant or the Chinese restaurant. You're making faces at me. What are you doing? <laughs> You just just wondering how many times you've gone out to eat. I just love it as a whole. We haven't. We cook at home a lot because of the the difference in schedules and because the service is so much slower. Because if we're out with our kids, we know that they usually go to bed at seven, but the restaurant doesn't open until seven, and so we're kind of on a rush to get out. Yeah, yeah. It's just like two hours. Two hours later, I think, if you could, you know, if you went out for breakfast in America at seven or something like that you know it, Spanish breakfast is going to be at nine yeah from nine to ten and Spanish lunch is going to be from you know one to three or two to four or something like that and then supper time is going to be seven or eight p.m. or even depending on the location uh, maybe even later yeah. yeah so that's very different if you're used to eating it like we used to try and go out to eat at like Five thirty or six, and that's like the end of siesta. A lot of places are still closed. So they're they're just closing, and then after lunch, yeah. they're like, we already ate, and the kitchen is closed. We already <laughs> ate. I'm like, well, I'm hungry. <laughs> what am I gonna do? <laughs> I would say, just as a as a general restaurant, like, don't be afraid to try something. Um, don't be afraid to just. If you don't understand what the Spanish is, if there's not a an English translation, don't be afraid to just point at something and say, "I'll try that," yeah. because you'll find, I mean, you'll find stuff that you don't like, but you'll find some stuff that you're really glad that you tried that you probably only find in Spain, and even more so, maybe even in only in Cadiz. Mm -hmm. What what foods have you found that you really enjoy that you found in restaurants or from having your grill outs with your neighbors or whatever? So for me, um, my neighbor makes this, it's kind of like a like an American hush puppy. It's like breaded, um, but she takes fish and she'll chop it up really fine and mix it in with this batter and then she deep fries. I don't know if you know the name like of it. I can't remember. Croquetas? No, it's, that's like potato-based. There's no potato yeah. in it. Yeah, it's there's just, no potato. It's just like a baking soda flour with some fish it in it. With some fish in it, and they deep fry it, and <laughs> is they're it, just really good. It puffs is out it like a, a log type? No, so it's, no she just still like drop biscuits. Okay. Only yeah. fried. So they're about the same size as like a little hush puppy. You know, okay. Just not very big, but those, I really like those. But I don't even know what they're called. I don't know what they're called, <laughs> but I really like those. I have fallen in love with Spanish cheese. I'm a little bit nervous to go back to America and have everything. Yeah, jamón. Yeah. I really like jamón. But it yeah. has to be super thinly sliced. I mean, if you if you buy, if you're feeling ambitious and go buy a leg of jamón, chances are you're not going to like it because you have to slice it like. You have to cut it yourself. Invis like you have to tough. be able to see through it for it to be really good. Yes, there's good. some good ham around here. Good experience yeah. to try to cut it yourself, but it's really hard. It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> did Did you ever buy we the did. entire we leg? Did. We did. Yeah, with we the had, hoof and everything. It was, yeah. We had family coming, and we bought a leg, and we bought the holder, and I got the special hamon knife, and yeah, it was it was tough. Did you watch like a YouTube video tutorial about how <laughs> to cut it or anything? I didn't. My actually, my neighbor showed me. Um, it we gone to their house for um, a get together and he had shown me how to do it and he had me practice a few times just um, but I was I was definitely not ready it's an art yes. yeah. it is. Yeah. well and it's so interesting that because it's cured ham it's so counter I don't know countercultural I guess they just let it sit out it doesn't have refrigerated nothing yeah. else and like it's covered in salt right and so I feel like when it's being cured it's covered in salt and that's fine but after you start cutting it and it's like exposed to meat, you just cover it with a cloth. Yeah. And that's it. And then if there's mold, you just cut it off and then yeah. you keep eating it. I'm like, that is so weird to me that you would yeah. cut off the mold and then just keep eating it. Because in America, <laughs> you would not do that. You would throw the whole thing out and then bleach your counter. <laughs> I feel like. <laughs> but 
that's I mean that's what they do and it's, they've been doing it forever. Yeah, so. and it's it's still good. It's, it's still good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that that leg of ham can last a while too. For a long while. Yeah. yeah. Oh. When I lived in Barcelona, I used to teach English in some companies, and Christmas gifts were a big yeah. deal. And I had some companies that would give me a leg of ham as a Christmas gift. Yeah. You know, yeah. instead of your, your Thanksgiving turkey type of thing. <laughs> that's your, that's Christmas your, jamon. It's your <laughs> Christmas jamon, yeah. Hey, I never turned that down. Right. Uh, what about practical supermarket advice? Oh, I know. So, I know this one. This is important. When you get your fruits and vegetables, they do not have a scale at the register. You have to put it on the scale in the fruit section and then push the whatever you got. Like, there's the little, I don't know, they're kind of updating now, but sometimes when you like grab cucumbers, there'll be a little number, like a 26, where it has the price, and then you go over the scale, you put your cucumbers in the thing, push 26, and they'll spit you out a little label. If you don't do that, then yes. the checker can't check you out. Right. That that is a disaster. Oh, it's frustrating yeah. when you think you've weighed everything and yeah. then you find that bag of red peppers at the bottom that I you forgot to weigh. That. Yes. <laughs> or like you grab the pre cut watermelon, you think that's already been measured and it hasn't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so my experience with <clears throat> the supermarkets, um, and talking to my neighbors about that, um, every supermarket kinda has its own thing. Um Mercadona is, I think, has the, the best produce. Yeah. Um, Carrefour usually has the best like, sales. Um, they have these discount racks, and they'll randomly put stuff in there half off or buy one, get one free. Um, but there's, there's so many different kinds of stores, and it's not like the States where you go to one large grocery store and do all your shopping. There's six six different companies of grocery stores here, Super Soul, Carrefour, Maxi Dia, um, and they all have different things. Like you might find drinks cheaper at one. Oh, the drinks. Um, the price is yeah. per bottle. So if you go and buy, you want to buy Coke, the price that yeah. they have is per <clears throat> bottle and you just take out what you want. You can take, take a can. Them. Yeah, yes. you could literally take a can out of a, a 12 pack and go to the register and buy that. Or you and can buy the whole fine. 12 pack. It you, doesn't matter. In America, you can't open up a 12 pack and take one can out. <laughs> yeah. That's really kind of about. That's how it's marketed <clears throat> here. You can it's yeah. per can or per bottle. If you want to buy a, a six pack of beer, then you pick up the whole six pack. If you want to buy three, you take three out of the pack and they'll walk away. Yeah. Do you have any embarrassing stories of experiences in supermarkets or anything or any sure funny things that happened to you? I'm sure I blocked it out. <laughs> <laughs> did you know about the coins and the carts when you first went to a supermarket and yeah, how that worked because all it's similar to aldi okay Aldi's and there is thing. there yeah, is an true. aldi here as well so yeah <clears throat> i think um one of mine was the parking and not knowing the word for parking um so in mercadona they have an underground parking and they asked at the counter oh, when you're yeah. checking out, do you have parking? You have parking? And oh. I just kind of stood there like, what? I'd, I didn't expect you to talk to me. Um, <laughs> I just want to pay and leave. What? And, and after, I think like three or four times of her saying, a park car, and I was like, ah, and then the light bulb clicked. And well, then, they do gestures a lot too. You can do a yeah, lot of gestures. So th that was probably one of the worst ones. I just kind of stood there and... Because she wanted to validate your ticket? She yes. wanted to validate my ticket, and I didn't know what she was talking about. Yeah. My friend actually got <laughs> she got past that, because she just said no when they asked, because she didn't know what she said. And so at the checkout, she said no, and then went down to the parking garage and tried to get out, and she couldn't get out. And there was this whole line of, like, six cars <laughs> oh, behind yeah. her. And felt like someone very kind. I told you, they're very, very kind. The Spanish person came up, and she's like, do you have a parking ticket? She's like, I keep scanning it, but it's not working. And like... Hang on, and she took her she took her ticket and her receipt and went upstairs and changed it and came back. Um, but yeah. yeah, how mortifying with her kids in the back and the groceries and like there's cars no. waiting. <laughs> this isn't one of those things. It's about a friend, but it actually happened to you. Uh, it, <laughs> no, it was actually my friend. We're gonna just stick with that story. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes they also ask you at the checkout about if you want a bag. Yes. And that's another word, if bolsa. bolsa. If you don't, if you don't know what a bolsa <coughs> is, I knew what a bolsa was before. But I remember when the first time I went to the grocery store, the person in front of me only had like two things, and she's like, "Go ahead ahead of me." And I was like, "Oh, thanks." And she said something, and I was like, "I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish." 
she was like, okay. And then the checker asked me if I wanted the bag, and I said yes. And the lady behind me was like, I thought you didn't speak Spanish. And I was like, I know the word bolsa. <laughs> I don't know what you just asked me. Yeah. So, yeah, they'll, they'll ask you, and you pay. You pay per bag. Yeah, well, I'd pay like maybe five cents or something three like cents or something. But the bags that you pay for are really high quality. They're super yeah. thick. Our neighbor uses yeah. them as garbage bags in her little trash can. They're very They're very durable. Very durable. And you could reuse them. But a lot of people use the reusable bags here too. Yeah, or yeah. little carts. I would definitely invest in a, a little grocery cart. Yes. Those, Cause the, well, we those live come close, in very handy. We live close to the Mercadona, so we walk over there. Oh, yeah. And then we don't have to carry With the, the wheels, the yes. little cart with the wheels. Or yeah. even just, you know, from your car to the house, if it's a short walk or well, if you if have you, street if parking. You don't, if you have street parking, yeah. we have street parking. They're, they're, it's very, very handy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Little things that you don't think of until yeah. you're yeah, because they don't they don't really have the little handheld you know carts in America because you drive everywhere you drive everywhere so everywhere that's you true. pull right into your garage or right if into you your have, driveway and if you have your cart then I mean your little little like bag with wheels then you can um, chain it they have a little lock system you don't have to carry it around I think I don't even know if they want you to carry it around in the store. Yeah. I have no idea. I haven't brought my answer yet. I just mostly use my, my car to the house. But you can lock it up, and then it's right by the checkout. So when, it, when you're checking out, you just go and unlock it, and then you can load up your groceries. That makes it easier, too. Yeah. Very good. What about um, being here with kids and your experience with schooling? Do you want to get into that area? Oh, I'll let you take that one. I could talk <laughs> for like an hour about it. Um, so my kids are currently five years old three years old and 18 months and in Spanish school and in, in Spain they can start school at three years and it is um, you can put your kid to school when they turn three in that year and so my first daughter's birthday is in December and so she would have been the youngest in the class um, her, so yeah she because she turned three in 2011 I don't know if that's right but so anyway we could have put her in that year and we chose not to because we thought that she was young, she was kind of impressionable, and, and the Spanish kids, just their culture is, is um, not abrasive, but they're just a little bit more rough. Like in, in America, you're always like, be nice, be gentle, and they're like, work it out amongst yourselves. And so the kids can just be a little bit more rough enough. My first daughter is very sensitive. So we held her back that first year thinking that she could go in as a three-year-old the next year. And she couldn't. She she just missed the whole first year, which I wish I would have known that because it would have been an easier transition for her. When they start at three years old, it's not like they start and they sit in the classroom the whole time. Um, there's a tra transition of, of, there's a period of transition where it's like one hour the first three days and then two hours and then three hours and then four hours. Uh, it's, it's a five hour school day from nine to two. Um, they have a little, they call it desayuno, which is the word for breakfast. But they also tell you to feed them breakfast before they come. So I don't know what that is for a second, second breakfast. Anyway, so <laughs> they, but the, for the first half of the year, for my three-year-old, my second daughter, who's three, she's in school now, and they play so much. I mean, there's always sidewalk chapel of the place. It's a very, very good experience for your kids to learn Spanish and to, I mean, it's a really good education. My five-year-old is reading in Spanish and in English. She knows all of her numbers. She knows her math. She can um, write and draw and speak in Spanish and play in Spanish. It's very, very good quality. She was writing her name and everything at four years old. Yeah. And um, she was copying sentences at four years old. So it's just very much more advanced than it is in the States. Um, with that said, it's also very challenging for the American kids because they don't speak any Spanish. In playground, it doesn't matter so much. It's a really great place for them to learn Spanish when they're playing together because there's no pressure. But right now, my daughter, is, my five-year-old, is having troubles. She's getting more frustrated because there's a little bit more lecture time when they're five, and she doesn't always understand what's being said. They're talking about the um, Camino, Camino de Santiago. Uh, Camino de Santiago, yes. yes. And so I, I think that they're talking a lot about that, and she doesn't understand. She knows Camino is to walk, but um, I think a lot of it goes over her head and she feels frustrated. I told her that when we go back to America, everyone speaks English, and she got really excited about the concept of whispering to her neighbor next to her in class. Because <laughs> I think that her Spanish friends are whispering to her and she's like, I don't know the context, so I don't 
know what you're saying to me. Um, so the language part of it, they learn a lot, but they are just obviously not fluent like all the other kids in their class. Yeah. What about your interaction as a parent with the teacher? How has that worked with a potential language gap? Yes. So last year we had a teacher who spoke both English and Spanish and her English was still limited, but it was enough to get by. You don't get a lot of feedback because of the language barrier. Um, I mean, you could schedule a parent teacher conference. It's not like they have those scheduled and ever, each parent meets with the teacher, you have to schedule it. And so if we could do that and, and bring in a neighbor or somebody, a friend who speaks both and kind of do that. Um, but I feel like when it's necessary, that'll happen, but you're not gonna get a lot of feedback on their progress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the teacher that at least my first five-year-old my only five-year-old. Your first five-year-old. Yeah, two five-year-olds. <laughs> My first daughter. Anyway, so she, her teacher now doesn't speak any English. And because um, she knows that I have limited Spanish, she hesitates to talk to me. And so I've been getting these papers all year. I think that they have words for her to practice reading because at least we'll practice reading them sometimes on her own. But no one would, it was never spelled out to me, this is what this is for. Or this, you need to get a binder and put all these in and, and all of that. Yeah. So you're kind of left at the mercy of, of figuring it out. There's not a lot of hand-holding that goes on. We had a similar situation. When we arrived, we got our son into a local Spanish school. Mm -hmm. He's third grade. And it was you know a few months after the start of the academic year. And we're both bilingual completely. My wife is from Barcelona. Uh, I'm bilingual. But we still had to take a lot of initiative. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to meet with the teacher. We didn't know how it worked. There wasn't a, there wasn't um, an intake for new parents. No. Yeah. It was. Which is funny because they have a lot of Americans. I mean, in this yeah. community, you would think that they would, but it's not geared for us. I mean, they, it's a Spanish system for Spanish kids. And so. Right. And I think the advice I would give to myself when I came was, just relax be because patient. be patient yes. exactly because we came from a school system from a Montessori school in the United States mm. where it was so interactive with the teachers and we knew what was going on and and so we had similar expectations yeah. and so when we came here it was just trying to figure out we get these messages in our school son's school that he has an agenda and so the way to communicate with the teacher he has an agenda in his backpack if we want to write a note to the teacher, we write it in the agenda, she reads it, and she responds back, and that's basically the main way of communicating back and forth. Oh. And then if we want to meet with her, we ask for what they call a tutorial, which is with our teachers every Monday afternoon. Yeah, the same with us. And then so we can go. Um, but, yeah, you just have to be patient. And, yes. Yeah, and, and find someone who speaks English. Or use Google Translate. Google Translate can kind of steer you wrong sometimes. <laughs> it, that is one janky app. But... I mean, for, for like word wow. by word, it's fine. But for if you have a whole parent teacher, like per semester, they give you a review on like how your kid is doing, like like most schools. And we did um, like a Google Translate photo on what it said, and it was almost incoherent. I mean, all good words, and so we assumed, okay, she's doing fine. But it didn't. The sentences didn't make sense at all. Yeah. But they so the infantile classes, they go down to the theater and and. They'll give you a slip um, that says, you know, we're going to the theater. Lice. We're going on field trips. The, the, so. Lice. lice. Lice is a thing at any school. It is a thing at any school. But I feel like because the Spanish hair is so thick and coarse, it's harder to get out. I don't know. I feel like we have lice notices several times a year. Really? Tea tree oil is fine. And um, hairspray. I mean, we've never gotten it. And none of our American friends have gotten it. Um, but just, I, mean, I feel like if there's even one kid in the whole infantile class, then they give out a notice. Okay. Just to let you know. Because I think there was a girl in my five year old's class, and then got a notice in my three year old's class like a day later. So I think that it's if one has it, if it's one reported case, then the whole school gets notified. They communicate to every, every parent, then you're saying? I think so. How but that's, they, again, I don't, that could it's be completely a lot of different. Like WhatsApp groups. So. Yes. Yes, all the information is on WhatsApp. <laughs> oh, so the, yeah, that's an important point because 
in the United States, it's not as popular. So if you're coming here, you have to get the WhatsApp. You That's W H A T S A P P. Just put that in your um, your app finder, and you'll get that one. Yeah. Yes. So tell tell us how the parents and teachers and all that use WhatsApp. So the teachers are not on the group, but um, so at the beginning of the year, you're supposed to pay thirty five dollars for materials. You don't have to buy pencils or paper or colors or anything like that. You just put thirty five dollars into like this group account, this group bank account, and then they can buy whatever material they need to from there. Um, and so we got all of that information on the WhatsApp group. It was we got like maybe. It might have been one slip of paper, but all of the information about where the bank was, because it had to be one specific bank in town. And um, anyway, so it's just it's just very helpful. If there's a notice and you're not at school or your kid's sick, then the teachers will, not teachers, parents will take a picture of the note from school, and so it's documented digitally in the group. So there's um, all of the moms are in there together. So if someone is sick or you know if, if Something like that happens like when post. they do the the things at the end of the semester where they they dress up and do the things like oh, they the get parties. together and I forgot about the, parties. the parties and the hey we're making costumes on this day <laughs> and, <laughs> what a pain um, <laughs> yeah because there's always the type A mom who's like you have to have exactly this shade of fabric and we're gonna we're gonna make it ourselves yeah. they always say make it ourselves we've had to make a dress last year and they just handed me a sack of yellow fabric and said here make a dress wow. <laughs> What? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't you can't just go to Party City and <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I mean they they do the for my three year old's end of year like Christmas celebration, we had to go and get the specific um, tutu from one specific store and all of that's in the WhatsApp group because I tried to just yeah. get, I just tried to just get like a red tutu from a different store. And they're like, no, 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 that one has sparkles, and it's too long, and it has to be this specific one. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's just a, well, it's a it's a good thing to know if someone is sick, or if there's someone has lice, you know, it's in your classroom, so you can take care of it quickly, or um, all of the, the costume yeah. planning funness. Well, WhatsApp is, is just good to have, too, because a lot of the Spanish people use it. It's very popular in Europe, so if yes. you want to message your neighbor in... Or your landlord. Or your landlord, you can message them in WhatsApp, and then they can translate it on their smartphone, because everybody has a smartphone. Um, it's, it's just a very easy way to, yes. to communicate with people. And it's not just the schools. It's um, like soccer groups or basketball groups or... Um, Sibiana's dancing, like that's like the flamenco dancing. They have those classes for like three year olds. Do your kids do Sibiana's? No. No. Because <laughs> when, well, anyway, I've got excuses for everything. They don't. Okay. They should, but they don't. <laughs> I'm kind of regretting it. We have the dresses and everything, and they just kind of stomp around the house and pretend. <laughs> Very good. Well, what about any other practical advice for people coming here such as in the area of driving shopping beaches what to do what not to do anything else that kind of stands out that you wish you had known before you got here uh, let me ask about driving specifically yeah, about roundabouts, roundabouts. Yeah. so roundabouts. we came from japan so we were on the other side of the car on the other side of the road so coming back to driving like you drive in America was a little bit of a culture shock after driving differently for three years in Japan. But I th yeah, I think the biggest thing was probably the roundabouts and just not knowing. And you you know you can take the driving classes and all that stuff, but it's still like the little roundabouts in town aren't that big of a deal. But you get into the bigger cities and Sevilla. There's and like multiple lanes. In the multiple roundabout. lanes and then like a, a stoplight within a roundabout Which or like a double that? roundabout together that makes like an eight and it's yeah oh, yeah I saw that in Sevilla why five or, yeah the five or six lane deep roundabouts in some of the bigger cities I think the biggest thing just in general for roundabouts is when you're approaching you look to the left because the cars are going to come around to the left and so if there's a car coming around the roundabout then you need to like stop but there's just a yield so the people who are familiar will start looking at the left if there's a car coming around the roundabout a good while away so they don't always slow down but if you're new, then you're like, okay, can I go faster? And I'm going the same speed as the person in front of you me. You almost come to a complete stop sometimes. Yes, and then the people around you are still going fast. It's super <laughs> awkward. So just keep an eye on the on the left part of the roundabout. 
because you're driving on the right. And then if there's a car coming, then you slow down if there's not. No. That's just the general rule. If there's multiple lanes, it gets more complicated. Or there could be a random yield sign in the middle of the roundabout where the people should uh, normally have the right of way, but at this particular roundabout, they have to yield to the right instead of oh, to yeah, the left. Oh, yeah, that happens by the McDonald's roundabout. Yeah. Like not before. So, anyway. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a rare. That's a rarity. Because the streets are so narrow here, I just found this last year when Lily was taking her driver's test. They have a stop sign and a, a light in the same place. And what I learned was when that is when they were both together, then you have to when you have a green light, then you can inch out and you have to stop again to make sure there's not something else coming. Or I don't remember why you have to do a double stop, which is so. And I might be relating that wrong, but that's why she failed her driver's test. There's all kinds of stuff that's just confusing like that when you're driving yeah. here. That's true. Well, I think roundabouts, like what you were saying about people who have experience, they're already looking to the left before they get to the circle. Yeah. The other day I was driving, and, and I'm doing that because I've driven in Spain for over 15 years, and I'm getting close to the roundabout, but the car in front of me, there was no cars coming around the roundabout. The car in front of me literally stopped. And I'm thinking, oh, they just got here. They just yes. got here. Exactly. <laughs> they're, they're new. Why? Like, what do? What do? Why would you stop before the roundabout when there are no cars? Mm -hmm. And my impulse was getting upset, but I'm thinking, okay, calm it down. You know, yeah. they're, they're not used to roundabouts. I mean, when I was in Ohio, I don't remember any roundabouts at all. They had some in Iowa on the freeways. By by a tumble. Yes, they did. It wasn't a freeway. It wasn't a freeway. It was a highway. I forgot the words. We've been gone for so long. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those things that they put it in, and within a week, there's already three accidents. Uh -huh. And it was a very, very tiny roundabout. Um, wow. But people, yeah, Americans just aren't used to it. Used to you got to know that the person normally, except there are, there are some exceptions, the person inside the roundabout has the right, right of way. Yeah. The person outside the roundabout has to yield to get in. Yeah. Yeah. And Sevilla is not easy. I, I agree that I was driving in Sevilla and it's a little crazy and the traffic there was really, yeah. really bad. So the tight roads in Sevilla, I don't know what that was her rat. We tried to go somewhere in her rat one time and we got into these little itty bitty roads like the one-way roads and we couldn't hardly turn our van because it was so tight yeah so some americans i know bring vehicles and i know a guy who recently came and brought his you know ford f-150 uh, yeah he's freaking out yeah and <laughs> yeah <laughs> so never go into old town stay up. yeah if you're on cobblestone stop and turn around <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just gonna get more and more narrow yeah, more and more narrow yeah. yeah so some i mean there have been places where I have flashbacks to my Chevy Avalanche in Ohio, and obviously it's no problem. And I have flashbacks thinking, there is no way I would have been able to uh -uh. got my my Avalanche into this parking garage uh -huh. or made that turn. Made that turn yeah. Speaking of which, our minivan, we have we didn't bring the minivan, but even we have a we have parking underneath our building, but our minivan is too big to fit down there. And the reason that I know this <laughs> is because our doors have a little bit of damage because I would try, you know, we've got the little small kids. I'm like, it's summertime, it's hot outside. I don't want to walk down the street. So I would try to park in the basement and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. So, I mean, it does work. It's just, it's not ideal. Not with my driving skills. It doesn't work. And there's a good chance you're going to scrape the side of your car. Hi, hi, chance. Yeah. <laughs> that's another thing I think as Americans, you got to relax about there is sometimes you park by feel uh, you know that parallel parking where yes. you kind of just bump the person behind you they and call it the road a kiss the road a kiss yes. is that what they call it here yes. yeah it's just a little kiss and don't freak out if that happens to you no, really yeah. don't freak out in fact i've actually on accident i didn't know the person was in there but i did a little bump with the guy still in there, and I was like, <laughs> and he was like, he didn't care. He didn't come out and start. No, and like, I'll check. I go back and check. I was like, yep, still a car, still a bumper. There's no bump. I mean, that's what a bumper is for. It's called a bump. <laughs> bump things. I don't great, like great not. Logic. Don't bump every single time. I mean, the more you parallel park, the better you get at it. Right. But parallel parking is a must. Huge Definitely. Must. Yeah. yeah. Well, especially if you're street parking. And on a one way. Yeah, on a one way. I love my house. Though. With cars behind you waiting. The parking isn't amazing, but I love my house. So it's fine. That's great. <laughs> <laughs>
Any anything else you would just final words for the audience or any potential foreigners coming to live here? Anything else you can think of? Any final words? I think I would just reiterate the the making relationships with these your Spanish neighbors or not even a, necessarily a, a neighbor <clears throat> that would just be usually the easiest um, but just making friends with Spanish people because we've had so many opportunities that we would never would have had um, all of the different festivals and things the days of celebrations that they flea have markets flea markets um, you know that that's not posted or advertised um, or if it is, it's in Spanish, maybe you don't know how to read Spanish, um, but knowing where to look for those things also, like, hey, where's the event calendar for, you know, that's not um, Well, on not that, that note, though, though. This, like, for when school started, you would think that the school calendar, they would know, we're going to start on this day. That was not the case. We didn't know when school started until the Friday before. And so, as a whole, James, they don't, they don't plan ahead so much and so they're not going to tell you it's kind of like we know the fourth of july is coming so we just know we don't have to make this big you know order things months in advance we just know fourth of july is coming so or like a week before we can put things together it's i think that's kind of how it relates because they know all of these things so they're not going to advertise it so much but if your friends like mike was saying if you're friends with your neighbors and say i don't know when these holidays are but i want to go yeah they can, they can they can take they can you. Mo- I mean, most of the time they're going anyway, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they will invite you. Or if not, um, we've had knocks on the door, and like we're all hanging out of the yeah. house, and they're like we're going right now to the parade. I was like, parade? <laughs> There's a parade. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put our <laughs> shoes on and go. And you know. Yeah. So just yeah, just making making friends um, and not being afraid. Um, and it's awkward at first. It we've is awkward. We've been here for five years, and so we've made some friends. But like, I think the, my first Spanish friend was because she wanted to learn English, and I wanted to learn more Spanish. And so we just had a partnership there. Mm. And we met by chance. She was a checker yeah. at one of the stores. Yeah. And she's like, hey, can I get your number? And I was like, sure. It was super <laughs> shady. But like, you just, you just put yourself out there and, um, yeah, do a culture exchange. It's super helpful. That's a very good idea. We, on a previous job, we would pair up international students with locals to do uh, an exchange where you would talk one hour in your language and then the other hour in their language or something like that. And to be brave enough to correct them. If you're doing that, be brave enough to correct them. Because she said that um, she found a moose in her house. I was like, I think you need a mouse. I think you need a mouse. And then we have our neighbor, for the longest time, she would call puppies poopies. I was like, that is not the right word. That's a, that is an English word. So when you type it, it, it autocorrects to poopies, but it's not what you're talking about. So you have to be brave enough to correct them. And then if you correct them, yeah. they'll correct you. And that's how you improve. Yeah. But it is kind of, I mean, we, we're very, I like to think that we're polite. I mean, you just kind of like to, like, <laughs> I understand what you mean, so we're going to let it go. But they're not going to learn unless you say, actually, you know, you're saying caca, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. point. Well taken. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for your time and sharing your experience with the community here. And I know that a lot of these stories and advice is going to make other people's life a lot easier when they come. So, yeah. really, thanks for joining us and appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah. Thank thanks. you. All right. This is Jeff Judge again, and thanks for joining the More Than Spanish podcast. Be watching for upcoming podcasts where I will continue interviewing people from abroad who have moved to the Cadiz region. Their stories, tricks, and tips will hopefully help you to settle into the culture, language, and life of Southern Spain. More Than Spanish is a local company based in El Puerto de Santa Maria. We help you excel while you are in Spain through our services of troubleshooting, Spanish training, and local expertise workshops. We have a new group class of Spanish for Beginners starting on Friday, March 17th in El Puerto. The class meets every Wednesday and Friday from 10.30 to noon. We only have a few spaces left, 
So if you want to get a jump start on your Spanish, sign up today by emailing me at jeff at morethanspanish.es. Check out our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash morethanspanish.es.